How's everything going? Everything's good. Yeah. Good. Just getting back into the routine. I feel you. Oh, yeah, I'm feeling a bit sick today, but uh, uh, it's the change yeah. from weather. Here it's like almost summer weather. Yeah, I've been going to like play basketball with like basketball jersey and t-shirt and sh- shorts. Yeah. Miami life, man. Miami <laughs> life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I actually might be meeting the mayor. Um mm. so- so like I posted this Twitter thread and at the end I was like, if you want to go play basketball or soccer, let's do it. And then I DM'd him and we're probably going to schedule something. So, so that was, that was fun. He retweeted that and the thread got like 120,000 views, something like that. So it's, it's that guy that's uh, running up for the mayor or somebody else. I don't know. He's the actual mayor in Miami and he's been basically using Twitter to... Ah, yeah, so he, he's a mayor. That, that's the one thing that I didn't get. I thought that he's just running for the mayor. No, no, he, he is the mayor. So he's been trying to get people to like, are tech entrepreneurs mostly, to like run their companies based in Miami. And he's been doing a great job on Twitter, like engaging and creating community and stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, so I saw it when, when Casey Neistat um, retweeted something with a, with a comment, like, I don't know, it was some kind of a, a local shop or the store, not local, but uh, he, he went in to kind of pick up some groceries or something like that and said, like, respect the people and buy it here, like, duh, 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 duh. and then people came out like, where did you see those shops that clean? It never happens, like, <laughs> it goes on and on. But I tweeted to, to my friend uh, who is kind of uh, already have the green card, um, got it on the, on the green card lottery and mm-hmm. planning to move to Miami, but they are ready, waiting now for the, for the laws and everything to, to oh, come up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, when, like I remember posting the thread yesterday and you know, it was like seven in the morning, I went to do something, came back. There was like a hundred notifications on my phone. I was like, Jesus. Um, and, and yeah, it was crazy how like this one retweet really like blows up your account. Your account. And, and yeah, it was fun. It was good to see. It's been useful to like just meet people from Miami and start networking and stuff. Um, so yeah, it's been definitely an interesting like experience of like Twitter networking really. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which to be honest like and this is a topic that we can start with uh i i know okay, you have gone all it's, in it's strange for somebody listening now what these guys are talking about yeah because <laughs> <laughs> uh, i know you have gone all in on linkedin um i focus a lot on linkedin as well um but what made you decide to go all in on linkedin versus a platform like twitter what would you recommend for companies that are in B2B when they're deciding whether LinkedIn or Twitter and why? So how how's your like decision making or approach to which social media is, is the right fit for yourself, for your clients, for your team? Uh, is it yeah, the one um, you like the best or the one that... Yeah, I mean, Twitter, Twitter is still the platform when you go to, uh, to consume the news first. That's, that's the, 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 the foundation of the platform. It's not business. LinkedIn is something else. It started as a virtual CV and then it moved on to um, entrepreneurs or just business people educating each other and connecting, creating relationship with each other. I think that's in the, in the core vision and mission of the, of LinkedIn. Uh, So, I mean, it's different, different kind of growth and different way to, to do it and to grow both platforms. So uh, I think LinkedIn is a platform where B2B people are going to hang out in the next 10 years. Twitter is not that. It can be used for marketing. It can be, I mean, I, I see it uh, having a best use as, as a platform for the company that um, 
has customers and it's big on customers' experience, especially in the B2C, uh, when they can get feedback of the customers, customers go to LinkedIn to uh, complain about things and to call out the companies that are doing bullshit practices. And basically this became a core of the, of the platform and you can go big over there or fail big. So it's both options are there, but recently there has been sort of a community uh, happening around marketing. So a lot of people that younger people in most cases that have been younger marketeers that have been developing LinkedIn, trying to figure out the Twitter as well. But you know, like Twitter is a bit different. You need to be uh, present over there constantly. You need to come up with, with different way to present it. Like one LinkedIn post can be a Twitter thread. So it's not just one tweet, it's, it's a whole thread of it. Uh, and it's a bit different. You need to engage more than, than you do maybe, maybe on LinkedIn. Uh, and from what I'm seeing is that uh, it causes a lot of bullshit for people to, to talk about. Uh, like there are some good marketeers, I won't name anybody, because for them it works. Like they come up with short tweets about different things and those are things that doesn't mean anything. It's just some things that you, I don't know, that you say over there and you can read them anywhere. It's not custom, it's not unique, it's not something that gives a good overview. And they use it to kind of uh, have a bigger reach and grow their accounts. I'm not in a game of like, getting exposed to more and more people, but the right people. So it might work for them. That's why I don't want to call out anybody, but it's not something that I would recommend and that I would do. And looking also from the perspective of where we are, like you are in, uh, in Miami, I'm in Serbia. And if I want to get more involved into marketing Twitter community, then I need to tweet from midnight up until like maybe three or four um, a.m. and it's not acceptable for me, so I'm okay with not going going on in in, in there. Uh, and also, like getting a client on Twitter is a, a bit harder. You can go and make relationship with people. That's okay because you can find out some things we already talk about on the podcast, like. Uh, I don't know, you mentioned uh, basketball and those kind of things. So you made relationship with some people from the, from the local community, or I don't know, you can talk about going fishing. And I, uh, if you are my prospect, I can use that when we communicate to kind of make a better relationship and kind of get closer, you know, for those kind of things. Yes. And so it's kind of different LinkedIn. I mean, it's, more approachable, it's, um, you can show more expertise into some things and can go from there on Twitter basically to compare it. Uh, people, marketeers measure who has the bigger one, just to kind of literally describe it. Uh, and I like to follow a lot of founders, entrepreneurs, there are a lot of CEOs, a lot of successful people that don't share on LinkedIn, but share on Twitter, especially based in the US. And I like that, it helped me to learn a lot and maybe to, to figure out some things just out of one tweet or, or a thread or something like that. And for that purpose, Twitter has been very useful for me. Yeah, the, the way I look at them is, I, I think it's clear that both platforms have different personalities, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're not the same. It, it, it's funny when you start thinking of like, each social media has a different personality. I like Twitter has one, LinkedIn has a different one. LinkedIn, I think it's more professional. It's a bit more to a higher standard of how you represent yourself. There's less shit posting, I think it's called. Um, I, I think we just don't see those posts. Probably. Like probably. If, I, if I get into the Serbian LinkedIn, oh my. <laughs> they, they still call people dear connections. Jesus. So. <laughs> um, and I like both, right? I like the way I, I'm approaching it in, in 2021 is LinkedIn is going to be very business focused for me. Uh, what I mean by that 
is that I'm going to be talking about stories or B2B thought leadership, personal branding. So I'm not going to go too far of my main area of expertise. One thing that I'm trying on LinkedIn, and you're going to start seeing it soon, is I'm going to have written 30 stories that have very little to do with personal branding and thought leadership. There might be some about running the business, but there are some about personal stuff. And for a month, I'm going to publish one story a day. Um, I don't know how that's going to go and, and, and turn out, but because some of them don't have anything to do with business. And I'm worried that it's a bit too Facebooky or, or too like transparent. Obviously, it's not going to be cat videos. It's going to be like personal stories that turn into a lesson for me. Uh, so I'm going to try that for 30 days, see how that works. And after that, it's going to be a lot more B2B focused content. Um, when it comes to Twitter, I'm approaching it differently. I, I think the way I'm approaching it is on LinkedIn, obviously, my main goal is to get clients. That's why I'm focusing really much on, on my core area of expertise. On Twitter, I'm approaching it in a different way. I'm approaching it with the main goal being a network. So building relationships with people. And I think to do that, obviously, there's going to be some business content and, and B2B content. But I want to try to like open up my areas of content creation. So I have created a mental map, a mental image of what I like to write about, right? Um, and for me, it's obviously personal branding, but then basketball, there's uh, music, there's politics, and then there's stand-up comedy. So those four topics for me are like uh, personal topics that I want to talk about and I want to build relationships with people on those areas. Um, so I'm going to be writing three, four threads every week about those topics and connecting them to personal branding or thought leadership. So like a few examples, and I, I have them here, so I'll just put it up. I'm just opening like my strategy for the year, just so like if people listening, maybe that triggers something. But for example, the first one was the mayor of Miami and social branding politics, right? And, and I tagged him, he retweeted, we're probably meeting with the mayor of Miami soon. Uh, another one I have is like, how Nike and Demand Generation's campaign of if you have a body, you're an athlete, it's one of the biggest and best Demand Generation campaigns in, in marketing history. I have ones about um, the, some about podcasting, talking about Donald Trump and how he branded himself on Twitter. So it's just showing the expertise of content and, and branding and storytelling with the main areas outside of work that I like and kind of bringing everything together. Um, so the KPI for me is like building relationships. So I'm going to be doing a lot of more engaging and DMing and then on LinkedIn, the KPI is getting clients. So I'm going to be more core focused. Um, that said, I, I really believe in the future of LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is going to have the next four or five years is going to keep growing. And hopefully I think the platform is just mismanaged. Like it sucks, but the people in there are so good. Um, and Twitter, it just, like a good platform that I enjoy personally. So I, I don't know if I'm going to get out of that. Uh, but when companies are creating content, I think they do need to make sure that they understand the nuances of each platform and how they have different personalities and the content has to be a bit different. So obviously you can repurpose some of the stuff, but then there's some content that you just cannot or should not repurpose in my opinion. Yeah, it, uh, I mean, Twitter is my favorite platform still since, ever since it started. I think I'm on Twitter since 2011 and uh, like there's an active community in Serbia and people who actually knows their shit, not only in business, but in politics and some so sports especially. Right. Uh, but like, I like it because it, it uh, demands of you to be present over there. Right. But you just like, schedule posts. It doesn't work on Twitter. So it's, 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 it's different. And yeah, man, I, I like the I like the strategy. I like uh, how you how you plan things, and looking forward to read to reading the stories. Yeah, have you um, kept an eye on what happened with Reddit and the stock market? No, no idea what's happening. Really? Oh, you yeah. you need to look after the after the episode because I was gonna talk about you with about like Reddit social media and 
like how niche those audiences are basically just to like give you a, a two cents of like what's happened oh yeah i mean i mean i know i know reddit i know how it functions and yeah, yeah. But, yeah so um I don't know how much you know. I didn't know much about the stock market, but in the stock market, you can bet that uh, stock is gonna go lower. So instead of like buying it for that, so that it goes high, you can bet that it goes lower. So you make money if the stock gets devalued versus if it goes higher, which is the usual way. Um, the problem with that is that one, you can make a lot of money, but you can lose a lot of money because the stock can always go higher and higher. And then you have to pay for that price because you bet that it was going to go lower. Um, and one of the biggest hedge funds called, I think, Malvin, um, I think they're best in New York. They uh, shorted the stock of GameStop, which is like a store in the United States that sell, used to sell video games. Obviously, this, it's not doing very well because it's a retail store, brick and mortar. And they're about to, they were about to lose their business. And then this Reddit community found out that this hedge fund was shorting and they all got involved into buying the stock and getting it higher. And the stock has gone high, like I think 15,000% in like the last two or three days. And the, their hedge fund is about to go uh, foreclosed. So they're going to close the hedge fund because they have lost, I believe they've lost like $7 billion because this Reddit community started buying it. So it was interesting to see the power of social media, right? Because obviously there, the reason behind it was not just to make money, but uh, people wanted to like say fuck you to the system in a way. Uh, and they kind of played their own game by manipulating Wall Street. Um, so it's interesting to see how people are, one, how niche down certain communities and how engaging they are. Um, and two, how they can create these viral movements especially when they have like social political background on them um, in order to like protest and in order to like change things. Uh, but yeah, it's a very interesting story. You should, you should check that, check that out after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let, let me just um, connect something with that. I just uh, submitted some my, that came to my mind while you were yep. talking about it. Cause like we were talking about creating the movement. But um, when I was talking with, with a lot of companies these, these last couple of days, um, and most of them are kind of in the niches where they are the experts or kind of like in top three in the, in the niche. And all of them are figuring out the strategy for, for social media, mostly for, mm -hmm. for LinkedIn. And uh, kind of... What I'm seeing is uh, when I'm talking with them, that they specifically know who they are talking about. Let's say like, um, we are a company, we talk with companies that are evaluated uh, on like $2 billion. And those are all senior people. And we only want to talk with them because we don't get referrals from anybody else. Only they, they are making decisions. And this is the content that we want to do. And this is what we want on the social media platforms. We want to, to look and act as a billion dollar company because those are the companies that we are talking with. Um, on the other hand, they don't think that uh, maybe they, there are other people influencing decision making. Uh, and they are kind of thinking of if they should uh, invest in educating the market because they are top three companies over there or kind of educating the niche because those things that they are doing, not many people are talking about, let's say on LinkedIn. So how do you see the situation? What would you recommend? Uh, would you go broader or would you fix your tone of voice and everything just to the, to the senior people or like, I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think I would approach it on a case-by-case -case scenario, right? Uh, I don't think there's a one answer that uh, fits all. Um, I think building a movement is harder than it looks, right? Like, I think people think of, like, this overnight movements, and they think that they can replicate that. 
and it's really not that easy. Uh, so I think especially as a, as a marketer, we tend to have like, um, I don't know how Americans call it, but not everything that looks like a nail needs a hammer. I don't know if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> Basically, yeah, yeah. not one approach. Uh, I know, I know how it, how it, uh, it is translated in Serbian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, like some, I think as a marketer, you need to think about is even LinkedIn the right platform, right? Or is content marketing the right platform? Or should we should be focused on content marketing that's very ABM focused and, and it's the right approach, right? Because if there's only like 20 people in the world that you can sell to, then putting out content on LinkedIn can help, but it's not going to drive the needle as much as an ABM focused campaign, right? Or, or even an outbound campaign. Um, Obviously, I'm somebody that loves to create content and build a brand, but sometimes outbound just is a better fit for the client. Um, so I think the first thing I would do is try to analyze each situation, uh, see how big the target market is, see who the people are, um, and then focus on the low hanging fruit first, and then try to expand. Right? It's easier to like try to build a movement and go broader when you have already some money coming in and you have some good accounts that you've kind of like nailed first. No, like now we are talking about companies that are top three in the industry. Right. So, so they already have lots of, lots of money in their plates, lots of clients, and they just want to wanna expand it and kind of get to the top one. That's, that's, that's the game. Well, if, if you want to lead that category, then I think investing in that branding and community is important, right? Even if they're not... Because a lot of times I think we focus too much on like the decision maker while we should be talking about the influencers to the decision maker, right? Because um, to me, if um, my team comes to me and tells me, hey, we should use this tool that I've seen on LinkedIn, can you check it out? Then I'll definitely check it out if it comes from an influencer on my team. Um, so I think sometimes we need to like go a level, lo a level lower and start influencing them. Um, but I do think if you're like a top three company and want to take that step towards the first uh, company brand, you need to do something that the, first, the other two competitors are not doing. And usually people are doing outbound, they're doing ABM. So if you can like maybe do that plus something or diversify your content marketing efforts, um, you need to own that category by building a brand and building a community. So. Uh, Obviously, without telling you that I would always do that because it depends on the situation. Uh, for companies in that position, it might be a good idea to really focus on branding and building that awareness. Yeah, and also uh, I think the important thing here is to, to say that you start building a movement by explaining one little thing inside the niche. You're not building a movement by, by going general and talking about general things. I mean, right. it starts with a with a spark, like Bruce Springsteen said, right? So it starts with a with a spark, and then you you create the fire out of it. And um, in this thing, if they start with a niche and explain one simple thing in a simplest way that everybody can understand it, not only the senior people, but the others can actually understand it. That's how you you start everything, and um, it's kind of something that uh, a company that's already built some momentum and uh, got clients and moved to the to the top of the niche when they need to create the new demand basically they already got the demand that's that's over there and it's kind of interesting the other example that i'm seeing uh and it's kind of an interesting topic to, to talk about is um Companies that are, let's say, big companies with like 500 to 2,000 uh, employees, but their competitors are the companies with 5,000 to 10,000 employees. Right. So totally different level. And uh, now when we look at their social media uh, profiles and how do they behave, the tone of voice and everything, they're behaving like those big companies, their competitors. 
you know and this is this is something that i'm that i was seeing a lot because like i've been doing less work and observing more and i'm seeing like a lot of fluff in uh in text posts of their of those companies like they are already there like they are talking uh, at the same way like those 5,000 to 10,000 employees companies are doing and thinking that that will, will get them to, the, to where they can catch the competitors. But basically, if you compare it to David and Goliath, the competitors are Goliath and you're David acting as a Goliath. Right. And it's not happening because you don't have the strength, you don't have, you're not that big. And That's a good point. Something differently, right? Yeah, uh, I think that that happens mostly because one companies are not very good at creating a strategic narrative of like mm -hmm. who they are as a company and and who they what's their message and what's their differentiators, um, and also because people just want to look bigger than they are, right? To attract more enterprise clients and all that stuff. Um, and, and if your goal is to be sustainable, probably that will help. But if your goal is to actually become one of those larger companies and compete with them, you're just not going to beat them at playing at their own their own game, right? Uh, I think, like just to make a basketball analogy, uh, like if you're playing against taller guys and you try to play like a tall guy, you're not going to win because they're just naturally taller. So you have to play to what your strengths are. Um, so when you're a smaller company, I think you're quicker. Right, you can take more risks and take into sort of your, what your message is. You can make faster decisions. You can implement changes faster. You can you're closer to the customers. And there's less bureaucracy. So I think you need to use that and then create a strategic narrative that differentiates you. Um, I, I was reading this article the other day of like th this company say they want to be leaders of the market, and all they do is compare themselves to their competitors instead of creating a completely new category and becoming an actual leader right? and people talk about this yeah we want to build this category but all you're talking about is the rest of people in your in your competitive environment so for p companies that want to really be differentiated and be uh, full leaders i think it's important to talk less about your competitors and build your own strategic narrative Right. Uh, I don't think you should even acknowledge that there's other competitors. If you're really that special, why are you talking about everybody else? Talk about what makes you special, but not don't even acknowledge the the other people who are in your field. Yeah, and, and talking about that, uh, possibly showing why you are special. That's kind of the thing that's that's always right. missing. Like, okay, we are special, we are nice, we have the best people, but show the people, show the results, show what you are doing. And when we are mentioning the strategic narrative, I agree with you with what you said. Um, I was reading the tweets from Andy Ruskin the other day, yep. uh, who's kind of big on strategic narrative. I interviewed him on my podcast, yeah. Yeah, he's, uh, I, I like his podcast as well, uh, especially the mother that's showing up in each episode. I don't know if you uh, I listen, haven't listened to it. I, I, I just invited him in mind. Yeah, he kind of uh, uses the topic and calls his mother before he starts uh, talking about specific thing on a podcast and ask her what she thinks about it. <laughs> Is it clear? You know, it's kind of interesting. That's funny. And, um, and uh, he, he said that uh, he thinks a lot of companies should, uh, instead of having a vision and a mission, just use a strategic narrative instead. Right. So I'm interested in your thoughts about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, just just for the sake of context, it's not mission, vision and mission that is, that is applicable. He was talking about those that, that we just come up with and live on the website. Right. Oh, obviously, I think that happens with the mission, that happens with the vision, happens with the core values, right? Um, one of my mentors used to say, you should define core values, but if you just put them on a paper and leave them on your desk, they mean nothing. Like, um, for, I think core values and, and mission and vision is something that the key, like the, the swipe test to know if people are actually living them or not, 
is start by asking them if they even know them. So I, as a company, when, when you have like a few, even obviously when you have hundreds and thousands, but even when you just have a handful of employees, most of those people don't know their core values of the company, don't know the mission and don't know the vision. Um, when I used to play basketball in college, we had core values, core values of the team. There were five of them. And each of them had a definition, like a standard definition that you had to know. And we had a notebook where we had to study them at the beginning of the season. And then they were posted on our locker room door. So every time you went to the locker room, you saw them. And um, about two, every two or three practices, our coach would literally stop practices. We were running like five on five or drills or suicides. And then ask somebody and say, hey, Michael, what are our five core values and explain them. And you know, you, your heart is beating at 200 pounds per minute. You're stressed, you're like, you, your ankle hurts. And now you have to like stop and think and say them. So if you don't really, really know them and to have them interiorized, you're not going to say them. And if you weren't able to like recall them, you get kicked out of practice. Um, so the first step is to make sure that people actually know them. Uh, and you should be able to ask anybody at any time and they should be able to tell you what's their mission, what's their vision, and what are the core values. So I'll start with that. Like, as a CEO, do you uh, people uh, know? Quick, quick question. How would you implement that to a company that's working remotely? I, I would just ask them. Like, we're in a Zoom call, and I'm like, yo, Nemanja, what are, by the way, what are core values? You know? And if you cannot tell them, then there's a penalty or something. Um, yeah, like, cause, obviously, because... Linda is on the call listening. That's why I'm asking. Oh, but let's not ask. I don't want to put her on the spot right now. But no, no, no. I didn't mean that. <laughs> but for us, obviously, when you're playing basketball and it's a team, it's a bit different because that, that you're a coach can do more to you than a boss can do to you. Um, but but there still needs to be some accountability to knowing people to everybody knowing the core values. Uh, so I'd start with that. I'd start with making sure people know them, make sure people leave them. Um, and, and you know, the, it should be a topic of conversation. I, I remember my mentor used to say that at his company, if somebody was not leaving to them, to the core values, somebody would say, hey, you're not being very empathetic if empathy is a core value. So there needs to, everybody needs to know them and people need to be accountable with each other. So that's how I'd approach it. I don't know what you what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree. And I mentioned Linda because she, she came to the company with those values. She already had them installed before before she came to the company. And yeah, she, she's saying that she knows them, by the way. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting. One thing that you mentioned that I consider very important is they need to leave, to leave them with how they work, with how they write, with... Uh, with how you manage the company and how you communicate with people, that's those are all the things that uh, that you need to uh, to implement in it. So it's not something just written on the website, let's say in remote work, but something that um, that you get back to daily. I mean, I'm trying to keep like we are having daily calls in the company, just to use in a, as an example, and basically I'm trying to come up over there. Because like now even Totsi is kind of running the, the things, the operations inside the company and everything. And I, I tend to come to the calls and kind of uh, be more of somebody who is like here to, to lead the team and maybe motivate them, inspire them, you know, like make them quit the work and go to take a walk and uh, entertain themselves a little, you know, just those kind of things just to remind them of, of what's important. Right. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember, like, or if you've heard him talk about this, um, but have you heard Andy talk about uh, old world, new world, and category creation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, like, when he came on my podcast, I think he put on a masterclass. Uh, and we talked about this, how each company should have the old world, the way that things used to be done before. Um, and a reason why they don't work and then the new world then the world where like the company has changed things 
and can be done differently. And then you have to name that category. That new world has to have a name. Uh, and it's something that I've been thinking about a lot uh, lately. Um, and I kind of like put some thoughts together. So for us, you know, like the way that people used to like brand their B2B CEOs was through PR. So PR was the old world. Uh, the problem with PR is one, it was overly expensive. Two, there were no guarantee of results. Three, there was no really audience owning. It was all about asking for permission. Um, and four, it was a sketchy industry. It was about who you knew versus who was actually worthy of getting recognition. Your content didn't matter. Uh, and you weren't really creating a direct line of communication with your target audience. You were always going through middlemen, Forbes, Inc., whatever it was. Um, so I think in the new world, the way you do that is through you know, social media content and, and b building your own content marketing machine on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Medium, on podcast, on YouTube, and owning that distribution to your target audience without having to go through a middleman. I, uh, I don't think you need Forbes anymore. You can just write a Medium. You don't need a radio show. You can have a podcast. Uh, you don't need a TV show. You can have YouTube. You know, the, the, this, the world has changed and the way we brand them have to have a name for that, right? Uh, and then the third step was this category naming. And for us, I think the, the name that I want to call it, and I'm still thinking about that, is like inbound CEO. Are you an inbound CEO as somebody who's going to use his own brand to drive inbound opportunities for your company or you're not an inbound CEO and you don't use your personal brand as a marketing channel? Um, so and this episode on, on my podcast was great to talk about this, right? Creating an old world, new world, and then naming the new world. I think it's something that each company should be thinking about doing because it really differentiates you. Yeah, we should, we should link that in the, in the description. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link because it's a great episode. Honestly, I think everything that Andy does is great. Um, and, and if you're a company just thinking through like what he says and like what, you know, what's the old world of funky marketing and what's the new world? I think you guys already have created the name of funky marketing as, as the new world, right? But uh, what, what do you think is like your biggest enemy or like what do you think is the thing that you're fighting the most as a company? Yeah, I mean, there, there are two things. First one is a bit to be as it was. So without, without emotions, without feelings, without creativity, all misty, foggy and companies talking about themselves, not caring about the customers, only showcasing their features, their products and not really helping customers solve the problems. And the second one uh, is marketing agency with like most of them doing um, posting and basic advertising, which is equal as doing nothing at all. And those are the things that, that were happening. And now that's why like the, the name is also funky marketing, doing something different, differentiate not only ourselves, but also the clients and everybody. Like I'm now telling everybody that start to work with us, like we are different. We communicate in more simpler way. We, we optimize things uh, as we go. We don't come back to the to do the things in a different way if we already optimize them. That's a big one if you start to work with, with companies that have uh, like all CEOs that are used to the whole company adapting to, to their way of work, you know, and those kind of things. And kind of changing the things, taking things which are um, specific for the B2C into, into B2B and changing the industry, coming up with the with new things, showing things in a different way, uh, focusing more on, on people, less on less on the products and on the features, but on the on the people and how those products and the features can help them accelerate uh, their business, their careers, whatever they're working at, and basically, basically that's that's it. I mean, uh, we, as, as you know, in December, like with funky marketing top voices, we yep. actually. I mean, you are one of them. We actually try to amplify the people that are doing exactly that new world narrative in, in our way, you know, so. Yeah, it just, I think it, that is a good exercise to do, right, as a company, because it kind of drives everything. It drives your 
outbound messaging. It drives your website copy. It drives your content that you create. Um, so having clear enemy, right? And it sounds harsh, but like people really unite against a common enemy, and, and it's an easier fight to create. Um, yeah, I it, think it, a little it, D2C it, it does, to it. But it, it doesn't need to be like uh, something that's specific and unique and doesn't have to be like the competitor. It can be Facebook, it can be Google, it can be all kind of different things. It, it, can it can be, be an habit, industry, right? Yeah. yeah. It, it can be a, just a way of doing that you don't like. Um, so this is something that I, I think it's important, right? Because as, as a company, uh, having a clear messaging can really change the value that's perceived in the company's mind, in the customer's mind. Um, so yeah, it's a good exercise to do, whether you're a marketer or whether you're just yeah, a founder. Like, uh, just to mention, uh, this is actually the things that I got really deep into with, uh, with P Playa on Funky Marketing Podcast because they are developing the winter AO, so the company that helps you differentiate. So we got really deep into that. It kind of checks uh, the way you, your copy is on the website. Is it different enough? What's the feeling when people are reading it? How do they reacting? You know, a uh, very interesting thing. And we got really, really deep uh, into those things. And is it different from like um, product marketing or product messaging? Or is, is it something uh, part of the same? You know, all those important questions. And I think it's, it's important that we ask ourselves daily about those things. Right. Do they use artificial intelligence or how do they kind of measure that? They have a bunch of writers. Oh, as far yeah. as I know, it's not it's not uh, AI. It's it's the people Got who it. are going through it and feeling it. And yeah, it's interesting. Makes sense. Yeah, I because I've been saying, I don't know if you send this, but uh, this AI that writes copy, copy dot AI, it's called. Ah, it's there's there's a, there's a better one. Uh, yeah. The the AI is called Jarvis. And it's conversions.ai. And it's kind of, they already have the templates for the social media headlines, posts, for the ads, posts, for the like blog name, blog outlines. Uh, and it sounds really good. So really? this is the best one that I've seen yet. Yeah, we should post. I don't know if they do LinkedIn posts, but we should see if they do them. No, one time. Nah, nah, so, so far, they, they didn't develop uh, for posts. Not one, but like what I've, uh, I've seen uh, is like Sean Wassler, one of the best copywriters out there, just created a full article uh, solely based on the on it, and he even created the, the article when he explained the way he used it. Wow! And it's good because it gives you the it extends the sentences, like they have all kind of templates over there. I tried some of the blog outlines. It's okay for how to and lists right. articles, uh, and it's worth trying. It's twenty twenty eight or twenty nine dollars per twenty thousand words, so mm. it's just enough for you to try it out. Uh, but it's kind of a good community. They have the Facebook group community, mm. and uh, I see a lot of people active over there, and it's interesting because when you sign up, like you get an email from Jarvis which is fully AI written. <laughs> That's crazy. I know we talked about this um, when we had everybody in on the end of the year podcast, uh, but it's crazy. Uh, just to see just an, up, an update on that. Like uh, we're going to come up with the article that written article that kind of sums up the whole that episode. So oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good episode. Um, and it's crazy to see how, AI and, and tech are evolving on that end. Um, but yeah, yeah, I highly recommend uh, what Andy does from a messaging standpoint. I, I know he works with extremely like high-end CEOs and startups in, in Silicon Valley, but, but the lessons can be applied to any business. So yeah, I highly recommend consuming his content as well. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say something now, and I and I forgot about it, and it was something important. But I will I will figure it out. But um, yeah, I'm. I think we've covered everything we want to cover. I don't know if you have anything else, but. Yeah, I think I think we're we're good. It's kind of strange when we don't know where we want to go, and we end up saying lots of useful uh, and good things. Yeah, there's there's hidden gems. You just have to find. Ah, out. yeah, yeah, yeah. I I remember what I wanted to say. So uh, to end uh, to add to this like uh, AI uh, conversation, I don't know if you have read, but like David Cancel of Drift uh, just gave his like five predictions for the 2021. One of the, I mean, most of them are based on the AI and digital transformation that is happening. Um, and kind of like AI is changing the job positions and what people are doing on those job positions. So like, and, and I'm seeing that even in, in funky marketing, like we have Maya who is basically running uh, AI tool that is doing the transcriptions for the for the videos, checking it out, like yep. making sure that everything is good. And it's basically changing things. We maybe in the near future, we don't even have writers. We have people who will just use AI to kind of uh, create posts with, with AI content that AI produces. Right. Yeah, I think they're still going to need some manual revision, but but yeah, that we can leverage that tech to make uh, things easier. Uh, final topic: What are your thoughts on Clubhouse? On Clubhouse, uh, it's good for uh, for like being a Q and A. Let's say now when we are on on Zoom or some big conference. But besides that, um, nothing else. I mean, you can use any platform to to kind of create bigger relationship with people and get into deeper conversation. Maybe you will find someone over there that you don't find anywhere else. Just all of a sudden you find them because like you need to find specific, specific group. You need to find specific guy who manages the group. So you have the best experience. And as I'm seeing comments, because I'm not an iPhone user and I can access it. Mm. So um, those are the things that, give people the, the best experience over there. And I'm seeing people spending hell lot of time over there. Uh, as on every platform, there are a lot of people talking bullshit. So, but it's something that's happening. Uh, anyway, uh, it's cool that the conversations are only audio and you don't have this kind of like uh, mirror effect or like need to prepare or something you can walk and talk with people and you know those kind of things and it's for me it's kind of one thing that might be good at fit because there are people's people over there all the time right so if you have a problem and you need somebody to help you like uh solve it uh if you have like the permission to to go ahead and join the conversation and bring your own thoughts that would be that would be great like that kind of help would be would be great yeah um my thoughts from being on it 80 percent is trash 20 percent is really good you just the problem right now is how to find the 20 percent that's really good um so when you hop into one of the right i think they're called rooms there's a lot of value there like i was in a room yesterday with like gary v and all his like vayner talent people and Vayner Sports. So it was good to see like all these athletes and uh, marketers at the same time just talking about how to market themselves for 2021. Um, I'm in a room every Thursday with like young marketers under 30 uh, and that's great. But, you know, it, it's a really like, like the time consumption that some people are doing it, I don't understand how they can allow that scale. Like I can do like 30 minutes or an hour every Thursday at 7 p.m. because I know about it. And then like five minutes every now and then when I find it. So I think the problem is going to be like consumption is going to fade. Um, but there's some really good stuff there that I think could potentially be helpful. So I, I think it's going to be interesting to see how that platform evolves. I think they've marketed really well. They have a good team on the back end. So um, it's crazy how 
we overcomplicate marketing and then it's as simple as saying only get in with an invite and then everybody wants to be a cool kid like, yeah over- make, it, make it exclusive that's yeah like it, fucking marketing is common sense and human nature like just like you wanted to be one of the cool kids in high school we all still want to be cool kids and we say hey you only get here if you have an invite and it's exclusive and everybody wants to like get in there so i guess that's the whole lesson i'm taking out of clubhouse just marketing is simple and don't over complicate oh it's it's always the one thing that i refer to when they ask me what are some things that you learned over the years that's like simplify everything yeah 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 even if it like because our job as marketers is to like or, or we at least i guess we have our, our ego and we want to look like we have a very hard job that we have to do right but at the end of the day it's really not that hard and you can simplify it um i mean it's uh you need to know what to simplify and how to right do it. It, it is hard it just yeah. it's simple but not simply it's it's simplest i don't know simple but not simplistic or the other way whatever uh but yeah i, I think that was it's a good way to end it unless you have anything else um i have a call in five but this is all for me that's all i think we i think we're good um i don't know if uh guys if you have any any questions feel free to drop them out during the week anytime like so they can include them in the topics for for the next episode and I think from now on we'll be we got there past everything like movement to the US uh holidays covid everything now we can be regular with <laughs> with the episodes yeah for sure uh but yeah awesome to talk to you Nemanja appreciate your time great man uh talk to you next next week absolutely take care brother.